Welcome to church. So you probably noticed I'm not Matt. I'm John. <laughs> Matt's, Matt's under the weather. He didn't make it today. Bless his heart. But we're praying for him. Every now and then it'd be like that. You just get sick. So uh, because I'm not Matt, what I'm going to say is not going to be like what Matt typically says. Um, I don't have any Dallas Willard quotes. I've not read any studies. I'm just going to tell you a thing that's really been changing my life and my family's life and we've been kind of working through in a good way. So I want to do something that would be out of the normal. So we're going to do a, like a visualization. I want you to close your eyes. So everyone close your eyes and you can feel the silence. That's good. I want you to imagine the person that in the last day or week or month or 15 minutes has let you down. Just who are they? Just you're looking at them right now, right? And don't get angry. Take a deep breath. Woo-sa. Woo-sa. All right, open your eyes. So you all, have a, you all have a person, right? Maybe that person's yourself. Maybe it's someone that, you know, you're married to. <clears throat> or maybe it's someone that you just kind of run into every now and then. I want you to say this out loud with me. You're going to repeat after me. It goes like this. You can't give. Now you say it. Let's try it again. You can't give what you don't have. Say it this way. I can't give what I don't have. Now one more time. They can't give what they don't have. Mm. Mm. Now that sounds simple, right? You're like, that's, that's the dumbest thing I've ever heard. It's so simple. It's actually a leadership principle that I read in a John Maxwell book. And, but it's also kind of like real life. And it's so simple that if you just know that, then it'll change you. And so when I look out here and I see people, like a lot of people I know, like I've met so many of you. I see doctors and teachers and police officers and all these different people. And everyone feels like they're worth what they have to offer. That's who you are. And that's what you think about yourself. And I don't know, we don't talk about it all the time, but at Bridge Church, there's these, there are three gaps. We look around and we look at the world around us and we see gaps in people's lives that they need us to figure out to how to help them with. One is identity, that's who you are, who God says you are. Wholeness, your path, your journey towards your healing. And integration, which is not integrity, it is integrity, but it's the things that you're passionate about in your heart becoming the things that you do with your hands and they fill up your lives, but it starts in your heart. And so this whole identity thing is kind of like stems around this. You can't give what you don't have, but you try to prove who you are by constantly giving a thing that you probably don't have. And so instead of slowing down, figuring out what it is you're trying to give and how to get it so you can then go give it, we often find our complete identity in, well, what have I given? What have I done? And so I'm going to talk about that just a little bit. But I also, <laughs> I also want to tell you something. So I've met a bunch of you, and this is, this is a funny thought. I've never walked up to anyone and they've been like, hi, I'm John, and I have absolutely nothing to offer you. <laughs> I've got nothing. I'm a taker. I'm not a giver. It's good to meet you. <laughs> However... <laughs> We all know somebody like that. They just didn't tell us when we met them. We had to kind of find out later. And if you're sitting here and you're like, I don't think I know anyone like that, then <laughs> maybe you're that person. So <laughs> I'm not saying you are. You got to go ask your friends. Um, <laughs> so it's just this really, really interesting thing, though, because we usually go, hi, I'm, I'm John. And they go, what do you do for a living? I'm like, well, I, I, this, whatever you call this, I do this. And they're like, oh, cool, so you just, you're a pastor, and that's who you are. I'm like, well, yeah. I mean, I'm a person. Um, and pastoring is kind of what I get, I get the opportunity to do, and thank you guys so much for letting me do it. But there's more to this than that. And there's this gap in identity. And we're constantly giving based on who we want to be, not on who we are. Mm, it's weird, right? So... 
And I'm trying to pay attention to my notes because every time I've done this, I've gotten so far off my notes that I don't know what I have and haven't said. So, like, forgive me as I'm looking at this. Something that, I, that is, so here's where it kind of meets, the rubber meets the road with me. My mindset has slowly been morphing and changing from, I hope I have something to offer so people like me. I hope I have something to offer so I'm accepted by others. Two, man, I hope I'm living my life in a way that I've got something to offer because I really love people. And because I love people, I need to live from a space where I'm not giving empty promises. I'm not giving empty truths. I'm living a life that's rich, and because of that, I have something to give. And um, whether that's, for some of us, it's slowing down. For some of us, it's speeding up. Y'all need to do something. But it's different for everybody. It's not going to be the same. So there's this interesting, uh, I'm going to say this. I don't mean this bad. So if, if you do these things, I don't think you're bad, okay? And if your whole life is full of these things, you're, you're great, Everybody's great. But there's this thing that you can do where it's like, you could adopt every kid in West Virginia. You could feed every homeless person. You could cure cancer. You could do all this stuff to prove who you are. And as many people as it would help for right now in the temporary, which is where we are, it's temporary. Life is temporary. It doesn't go forever. Eternity is forever. But you could do all that stuff here and then think, so that's who I am, right? And I sound like a broken record right now, but I'm trying to explain this because there's a way in which we think about it at church where you're like, well, he's not talking about me, like not the stuff that I get to do. You could help it every single night to shine. And that's good. That's actually great. And we hope you do. But it's not the thing in which you get your identity from. It's not the thing that closes the gap on who you are as a person. The thing that closes the gap on who you are as a person, only God can do. That's, that's what we believe here at our church. It's not a teacher, and it's not a nurse, and it's not a doctor. It's, it's not military. It's not civilian. It's not architect. It's, it's not sound guy. It's not camera person. It's none of that thing. It's not even a pastor. There's a thing that only God can say about you. And when you know that, and you know who you are. So I want to tell you a story um, about how I used to have this construction job. And I, it was a nonprofit construction job. And we would go around downtown Cincinnati and fix up old homes so people didn't get evicted. Because when they paid their taxes, it made the city happy. And so they made sure that there was money to fix their houses so they didn't lose their homes. And it was actually really fulfilling. And I did it for like five years. But I didn't know anything when I started, so they always put me with an older guy who definitely knew some things. Maybe not always about construction. But <laughs> these people had seen stuff. And I never forget that it was just common practice where you would hurt yourself and be proud that you didn't go to the doctor. And I mean, like, has anyone else ever done construction and seen it? I, I'm looking at, a okay, so you ever work with a guy and they, they cut their hand open, you're like, man, you want me to take you to the doctor? And they're like, how dare you? <laughs> I have duct tape. <laughs> and so they wrap up their hand and, they, and the next day they're in the parking lot of the shop and they're like, man, dude, I hurt myself so bad yesterday, didn't even go, didn't even go to the doctor, didn't even get an x-ray. And they're like, you know, you're looking at me like, I think you should. <laughs> and it's this weird badge of honor that you're like, I'm so tough that I don't even need help. I'm so bad that like, man, I can fall off the ladder and break my ribs. I'm just going to keep working. But you know what else I noticed? So that the longer I did it, I started to recognize that these guys, the same guys that were proud of being tough were the same guys that were going van to van in this parking lot. They're like, hey, man, can I get some Vicodin? Can I get some Percocets to kind of like get through the day like I'm in a lot of pain? And over time, this badge of honor kind of be, turned into this big secret. And it was like, well, no, like I'm tough and I can fall off ladders and I'm good. But secretly, I'm on drugs <laughs> to, because I can't cope with this pain on my own. But I'm not one of those people that go to the doctor, though, you know, or I'm not one of those people that go to a counselor. I don't need that. I just, you know, 
Yeah. So what's really interesting is that badge of honor becomes this giant secret that you portray as a badge of honor, and the deeper it gets into addiction and the deeper it gets into like life actual problems, the more you avoid the doctor that you need to see that you would have just like visited once, it would have been great. And <laughs> I don't know if you know this or not, but we do a really similar thing in church. I've seen a lot of people slap a date night or a vacation on what you should have, should have did marriage counseling. Or we do a lot of tough times, hard circumstances, like you know what you need to do? Pray. And you're right, you do. But like maybe change. And it's like we, we've created this standard of, li- of you have to have faith and that's your life. And all this is imaginary and you don't have to change this. You have to do all these church programs and these church things. And I'm going to tell you a real story about a real person, but I'm not going to share any names. But this actually happened. And it blew me away when they, when they told me this story. So one of my friends had some parents. When they were younger, they were, the parents were going through a really hard time. I mean, like the family was going to break up. It had gotten as bad as it could like possibly get. And so they were at church and they'd met with a pastor and they said, listen, this, I, we don't know what to do. I don't like her and she don't like me and we're sick of this. And the pastor's like, well, let me think. I think the best thing you could probably do, you guys just need to get back in the choir. You just need to keep marching. And you know, like that, like right now you hear that and you're like, really, someone said that? Like, yeah, someone said that. They weren't a bad person. They didn't mean bad, but it was this whole thing that we've set up that like you're good because you're here and you do it. You're good because it looks good on the outside. You're good because it, it makes us feel right and it lines up with what we already think and that's what makes you good. And so that leaves an awkward tension of like, like but this church thing, this Jesus thing, this will fix me, right? And like the short answer is like, yeah, it will. Jesus and coming to church will change your life. I mean, like, for the good. But there's this, see, there's this caveat, um, not on Jesus, but on us. The only things that change are the things that you're willing to be honest with God about. Like, it's not like you can secretly keep buying Percocets in the parking lot and then somehow a doctor can fix you with never visiting. It's really not like that. And like, like here, it's, it's like, uh, oh man, you got, you got another one of those work days coming up? You, you, you need me to come help with something? Can I go do something? And we never ask the question of why do I get here to where I feel like I need that to be okay? And see this whole, like you can't give what you don't have. We're constantly running ourselves empty on fumes, trying to give, 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 and get acceptance and prove we're, we're good. We don't even have it to give. And so this like paradigm shift of, you start thinking about your life differently, and it's not, well, I need to go do some more good things, and that's gonna help. It's more like you need to change your life, you need to give God access to your heart, and then let him change some things so then you have something to give. You become a person who has something to offer. I'm gonna read you a scripture. And like I went to this, um, I went to a Christian school through eighth grade. It was like HTR Berean Baptist. And they use the King James Version. So like all the scripture that I can quote only comes out in King James. And I'm sorry, because I know that we're, we like lots of versions. And I'm gonna read different versions, but this scripture felt weird when I read it different, not King James. So that's my religion, I'm working through it, okay? Matthew 6, 33, we're just gonna be up on the screen. But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. Who's heard that scripture before? I know I have. So just about everybody, right? What does it mean? (laughs) As a kid, uh, like the first time I ever heard that, I was like, so like Indiana Jones style, go hunt down where the kingdom of God is, and like get it? Or, or what, <laughs> like, what are we saying? Or like, have all these things, all these things added unto you. Like, I've heard it used a lot of weird ways, but I also was like, I don't know what it means. Like, what things? Like, what you want? 
Like, I don't know. Well, let's go back. I want to take you to the beginning of Matthew, where this chapter where this is quoted in. And I want to read a good chunk of the beginning of this. Because there's a lot of context here that no one ever read to me when I was a kid to help me understand what this meant. So now this is going to be in the message. Mm, yes, so Matthew 6, 1 through 13. Be especially careful when you're trying to do good or to be good so that you don't make a performance out of it. It might be good theater, but God, who made you, won't be applauding. When you do something for someone else, don't call attention to yourself. You've seen them in action, I'm sure. Play actors, I call them. Treating prayer meeting and street corner alike as a stage. Acting compassionate as long as someone is watching. Playing to the crowds. They get applause, true, but that's all they get. When you help someone out, don't think about how it looks. Just do it, quietly and unobtrusively. That is, the way of our, that is the way you are God, who conceived you in love, working behind the scenes, helps you out. There's more. And when you come before God, don't turn that into theatrical production either. All these people making a regular show out of their prayers, hoping for 15 minutes of fame. Do you think God sits in a box seat? I want to stop there because, man, that was really uh, savage. Is that how the kids say it now? Man, when he said that, he was like, I'm going to light them up. Anyway, here's what I want you to do. Find a quiet, secluded place so you won't be tempted to role play before God. Just be there as simply and honestly as you can manage. The focus will shift from you to God, and you will begin to sense his grace. The world is so full of so-called prayer warriors who are prayer ignorant. They're full of formulas and programs and advice, peddling techniques Forgetting what you want from God? Don't fall for that nonsense. This is your father you are dealing with, and he knows better than you what you need. With a God like this loving you, you can pray very simply. Then he kind of goes on there, and he says, so pray like this. Now, when it says, like, seek first the kingdom of God, and then he kind of trashes all the, all the religious people that were doing this publicly trying to get fame... It's really kind of weird because he doesn't say, well, well, this is what I actually mean. He just says, don't do it this way. But then there's more. And so I'm going to read a little bit more. So let's do Matthew 6, 19 through 21. Don't hoard treasure down here where it gets eaten up by moths and corroded by rust or worse, stolen by burglars. Which Have you guys seen where the, the bank shut down? Oh, man, that's... That would be the worst part here. Anyway, stockpile treasure in heaven where it's safe from moth and rust and burglars. It's obvious, isn't it? The place where your treasure is is the place you will most want to be and end up being. And in Matthew 6, 30 through 33, if God gives such attention to the appearance of wildflowers, most of which are never seen, don't you think he'll attend to you, take pride in you, do his best for you. What I'm trying to do here is to get you to relax, to not be so preoccupied with getting so you can respond to God's giving. Now, that's relevant because why? You can't give what you don't have. People who don't know God and the way he works fuss over all these things, but you know both God and how he works. So steep your life in God reality, God initiative, God provisions. Don't worry about missing out there's nothing to miss out on. You'll find all your everyday human concerns will be met. So he says all this stuff, and at the very end he goes, but seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and then all these things will be added unto you. And so it's less confusing, but still not like black and white super clear. It's black and white clear like that he's talking about not the actions you're doing, but the heart that you're doing it from. And so I think if, if, if I could um, translate that scripture in like a John Henderson version, I would have to have you look at a few other things. So when it says kingdom in this scripture, you and I think of, well, I don't know what you think of. I think of like England. <laughs> or I think of like, you know, the Wizard of Oz. There's like a kingdom there. And it's a place and you go find it. But that's not what it means. When it says, seek first the kingdom, it actually means seek first the rule of the king. 
And so where it's not a place, it is a kind of a posture of our heart where what is being said in the scripture is saying, first, before you do anything else, like before you try to learn theology, before you do all this stuff, get your heart to where you're willing to let God rule the whole thing. Not just the parts you're proud of, but the embarrassing and the shameful and the hurtful stuff. So, so that's how the scripture starts. But then it says this thing about righteousness. I know that could be really triggering because you know, there's this whole term called self-righteousness. And then if we've all grown up in church and a lot of it was like, do good, be good, not like, really that was a lot of it. And so in Philippians, there's this scripture that I found. It's 3.9, and we're gonna put it up on the screen. Um, now this is the NIV. And I, don't, I know it means New International Version, but I do remember where churches were very upset about it for a long time. So I'm going to use it anyway. <laughs> Philippians 3.9. Here's what it says. Be found in him, not having righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but which is through faith in Christ. The righteousness that comes from God on the basis of faith. And because when I always see righteousness, I think of like, well, don't do anything bad. You know, you got to be righteous. You got to be, the church I grew up in had this terminology called uh, standard of holiness. And basically what that meant was you couldn't do anything. Like, no fun. Zero fun, long skirts, praying in tongues, lots of fasting. And that's what that meant. And I'm being mean. It probably meant something a lot more than that. Um, But that's really kind of warped because... In this scripture, this kind of points out where you get your righteousness from in a way that's like really profound that you can't do it on your own. You kind of, you're depending on Jesus to do it for you. And so the only way you can be righteous is to believe in him. So then the scripture, now it's morphing into a different thing again. So it's like, so seek first the desire to let God rule every part of your heart and also this deep-rooted faith in what Jesus did for you and like cling to that and know that in that, that is how you're being saved. That is how you're being redeemed. So it's really weird because it takes the focus off of us in the performative sense but puts it on us in a really like, you actually have to believe it sense. So if I were able to like translate this and what I actually think it's saying, it says, But seek ye first surrender to God and allow him to be your king. And his son Jesus, accept his love and his mercy and his forgiveness and his freedom. And then your life will change. And the stuff that used to torture you and torment you it won't be able to torture you and torment you anymore because you'll be free. and, And when you think about this scripture in the deeper sense of your heart, not just what you do with your hands, it really kind of opens up this idea. Well, yeah, I can't give it because I don't have it. I can't save people. But I also don't have to go earn it. So the thing that God gives to me for free, the thing that changes my life the, th- the thing that is the reason I'm here today is the thing that I'm still kind of searching after. I'm still working toward. But it's also the thing that I give. And so this economy of heaven is not like a lot like what you experience here on earth where it's like, well, how many hours did you put in? You know, where'd you go to school? Show me your, um, what do you call that when someone has a degree? Your, t- not a title, anyway, there's a word for it. And it's like, we work really hard on it. And we, we go to school, and you get your master's degree, and you pass your praxis, and then they give you all of our bad children. And, and we work hard for that because you've proven that you're able to do it. But see, in the kingdom of heaven, it's like before you're able to prove anything, you get it. And then once you get it, because you experience that love, well, that is like the gas in the engine that causes you to then go be different. And yes, it's way more complicated than I'm making it, but for right now today, it's simple. It's very, very simple. You can go ahead and come on, Matt. 
See, I'm not as slick as Matt. I have to actually say things. Matt, he's slick. He can get it going. So, he really can. So, what, so, so then what? And this has been short. You're welcome. So then what? <laughs> so God wants to change your life. Yep, you hear that every week. Identity, there's a gap. You hear that a lot around here. It, it can only come from God. You've heard that before. Like That's all there. That's all intact. I don't have anything new or different or profound to tell you on top of the idea that if there was a white flag, I'd wave it. This whole, I'm trying to earn your respect, I'm trying to get you to like me, I'm trying to do the right stuff so everyone else doesn't think I'm bad. Man, it's exhausting. Or at least it is for me, and I don't know, maybe you guys, you do good with it, and you might. But the stuff that you can pin to your lapel, your position, is not the thing that God says about you all the time. Doctor is good. God says son. He says daughter. You, maybe you have a, a, a thing that says DUI. God says no. I just love you. And this white flag that we're waving is an open invitation. And it's to be weak, and it's to be human, and it's to be vulnerable, and it's to be honest. And it's at that point where God says, now, now I have your heart. See, it's too easy to put my bulletproof vest on and act tough and to fall off ladders and take Percocets and Vicodin and to put duct tape on my stitches and Neosporin when I just need a doctor. It's too easy because then I'd have to admit that I'm human. And see, the reason that God came through Jesus is because he loves humans. I mean, he loves you so much. And you think that there's a thing that you're going to show God that might change what he thinks about you, and you're wrong. And so this whole, but seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and then all these things shall be added unto you. That's not a challenge, that's an invite. Come join the party. Whatever step that is for you, some of you have been making it look good for years and God's dying to know the truth of it. He's dying to hear you admit it because he loves you. Some of you have been so broken that you've claimed the title victim and you just take and you take and you take because you don't think that you have anything that you could ever offer. It's just not true. So wherever you are, whether it's you know, maybe your first step is like, yeah, I want to know God more in my heart, whatever that means. Or maybe your step is like, I'm ready to tell God the thing I've never told anybody else. Or maybe your step is, I'm ready to leave this fighting and this working for my own righteousness behind to get what God's been trying to give me my entire life. No matter where it is that you are, God already knows and he sees it and he loves you and he's here in this moment. And so at the end of all I have to say today is you're invited. You know in high school when there'd be a party and you're the one person that didn't get to go because you didn't get the invite? That feeling, the left out. So this is... Imagine this, the same party, but you're invited. And all that's left is for you to like go. And you don't have to 
look perfect and you don't have to act perfect. You just need to know you're invited and you can go. And so I'm going to pray for us. And I hope that if you are here today and you're a parent or you're a son or a daughter, mom and dad, husband, wife, before I pray, there's just this one thing. I want you to look at who you're next to. And if your kids are upstairs, you're saying this for your kids. You're going to say this with me. Say, I can't give what I don't have. Matt said something really profound a few months ago. He says, and I'm going to mess it up. He said it different, but this is what he meant. I just know. What you don't let God transform, you transmit. Your parents are mean to you. And you don't go seek out the healing that God's trying to give you and that wants for you. You ain't doing nothing but just passing it along. And so when you say, I can't give what I don't have, well, you need to get it <laughs> because you're invited. So today, as I pray, remember those people we were looking at? We're like, oh man, they, they've, they've let me down. They've disappointed me. God loves those people. <laughs> and he loves it when you forgive them. And so take God's mercy and grace and forgiveness today as a gift that you all get. And as we're praying, I want you to think about those people. And I want you to give them the thing that you wish you always had, which was forgiveness. And I want you to give it because God's already giving it to you and you have it. And when you go home and you're around your kids and like your anger starts to boil up, I want you to remember that you can't give what you don't have and your kids, they need it. Your husband, your wife, they need it. So bow your heads. God, thank you so much. The way your presence can just fill a room and get in the hearts of people and open up our ears to hear you. Thank you so much for that. My prayer today isn't that you help our church make perfect people. God, I pray that we get to the point to where people stop worrying about how perfect they are to be here and to experience you and to know you and to feel your love and acceptance. So whether someone's out here, God, and they're asking who you are, or whether someone's out here, God, and they're telling you things that they've, they've just kept bottled up for all those years, I pray that the love that you've given me to help me overcome what I've had to get through in my life, that you make that real for the people in this church today. I pray that you give us peace and mercy and love and you empower us to deal with the tough things. God, I pray that you give us what we're after and we can live a life where we have something to give. God, I pray for the, young, for the young people, for the old people, that you make them feel known and loved by you. God, and help me play a part in that, whatever you need. Help us be the type of people that you're looking for. And help us be the type of church that you love to send the broken and the hurting and the confused to. And help us be a place where healing can happen and pe people can know you and you can reveal yourself to us and you can grow us and challenge us, God. Help us be that. And help us do it and have fun and be happy and have your joy about it too. And it's in your holy name we pray. Amen. Amen. I love you guys so much. Thank you for listening to me. I hope you have a great week and we'll see you next week, all right?